Thank you to the entire panel who, who welcomed us today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, just to add a little bit to the introduction, um, I am an INSEAD graduate. I was one of the first cohort of INSEAD uh, MBA students to, to receive a social entrepreneurship scholarship. Um, and Hans knows that um, I now feel so indebted to INSEAD that I'm willing to do just about anything, uh, include flying from, including flying from South Africa to, uh, to join you here today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, again, by way of background, um, Grameen Foundation, many of you probably know the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Um, Grameen Foundation is affiliated with the bank. Um, it is an innovation center. Uh, focusing on um, particularly mobile technology innovation around uh, agriculture, health, and financial services. So, um, although uh, I work a lot in technology, I'm not really going to talk to you today about technology. I think we have a number of different fora in which to discuss um, technology in greater detail. Technology for me is a tool, it's an implement to be able to affect change. And so what I'd like to talk about today is social change, and particularly behavior change. What is entailed in actually changing the behavior of the people that we're trying to reach? Because no matter what field of social entrepreneurship any of us come from, there is some element of behavior change involved in what we're trying to do. Whether it's the target group that we're trying to support, or policymakers we're trying to influence, there is behavior change inherent in everything that we do. So I'd like to talk about behavior change, what Grameen has learned over the years uh, about behavior change, and I'll give you some examples, both from technology and from advertising, um, about uh, successful experiences in behavior change. Okay, um, so as I said, I'm quickly going to talk about the most effective ways that we found to change people's behavior. This is based both on our own experience uh, in the work that we do developing uh, mobile solutions, uh, as well as some of the research that we found to be most uh, pertinent. I'm going to talk a little bit about what impact um, technology has on, uh, what impact what we know about behavior change has on technology design. And then I'd like to talk for just a moment about how technology itself can change the way we think about behavior change and can, can get us to think in new ways about changing the behavior of the people we're trying to target. So there is a, a researcher named B.J. Fogg um, at Stanford University who runs uh, a laboratory uh, called Persuasive Technology Laboratory. Um, and he has written extensively about behavior change. Um, and his ideas are deceptively simple, as most of the really good ideas, I think, in the world are. And what he talks about is three components of behavior change. That fundamentally, there are three things that we need in order to change people's behavior. The people we're trying to affect have to be motivated, right? They have to want to change. There has to be a desire for change. Secondly, there has to be a trigger. There needs to be an event, something that spurs people to change. And then finally, there has to be an ability to change. It has to be possible and even easy for people to change. And I'll go into each one of these in a little bit more detail. But you can see that, and this is the, a, a graph, a simple graph that um, uh, Professor Fogg and his students have created. And it's, it, it's common sense. If people are highly motiv motivated, but they have a very low ability to actually do something about it, the chances they're going to change the behavior are very low. If they have a high ability, but they're very lowly motivated, or they don't have triggers, there's no, there's no event that allows them to actually act on that, the chances of behavior change are very low. So again, deceptively simple, and I'll talk about how this manifests itself in the work that I do. Um, I'd like to first actually show you a video that has nothing to do with um, what I do, um, but I think hits at these three things quite well. And so I'd like to just take a look at that. What are you doing? You're 
day and during my life. Just returning the favor. So this, um, as they're called, public service advertisement in the U.S., um, was highly successful in the, uh, the area of the country where it um, played. And what's interesting about it, and I will go into a bit more detail, but what's interesting about it is the advertisement itself focuses not on what n the messages we normally see about not smoking. And I realize this is a very sensitive subject in a place like Madrid. So I, I'm sorry for all of the smokers in the room. Um, but it assumes that uh, n most of the public service adver as advertisements focus on guilting people into changing. Right? Smoking is bad for you. They show these horrible pictures of your lungs and these kinds of things. Those things don't work. What's interesting about this one is that it's focusing not on the effect of your behavior on yourself. It's focusing on the effect of your behavior on someone else. Right? It's about my smoking can potentially kill somebody else, just like if someone were driving erratically on the road. That immediately creates a social dynamic in the relationship that tips the balance in terms of the motivation that somebody has. It also, as you saw at the bottom, there was a, a number that ran on the bottom. And it was a, a very simple number to call about stop, stopping smoking. That creates the ability, makes it very easy for someone who is potentially motivated and sees this advertisement and thinks it's funny, but gets the idea that I'm actually endangering other people. It gives them the ability to actually act on it. So this is a small example of how messaging around behavior change is critical. So let me turn to that a little bit. What motivates people to change? The research and our own experience find that social norms are the strongest predictor of behavior change, but they're the least understood. So I'm sure many of you have um, been involved in different surveys or questionnaires where you're asked about your interests or your likes. People are notoriously terrible at being able to communicate their likes and their interests. It's actually observing what people do and how they behave that tells you a lot more about people's likes and interests. One small example that I like to give is street musicians. And I put up a picture of street musicians. There was a study that was done in the western part of the US about what motivates people to actually give money to street musicians. And what they found is it's not the amount of money that's sitting in the guitar case. You know how they always put a little bit of money in there? That has nothing to do with it. What drives people to put money in that guitar case is when they see other people doing it. So the smartest thing that this musician could do is pay a friend of his to come by every 15 minutes and drop money into the guitar case. Because people are reacting to the behavior that they're observing in others. It's a social interaction. Even though it's unspoken, and even though the people that you see doing that, you probably, probably don't know. But you are behaving, you're altering your behavior because of how others are behaving around you. Um, let me just talk for a minute, and again, my field is, is ICT uh, for development. So I realize that more broadly, we're talking about technology, um, appropriate technology and other kinds of technology. I want to ground some of our findings specifically in ICT. But again, these lessons about behavior change are relevant, I think, across the board. Um, in our own experience at Grameen Foundation, we have found that the trusted intermediary um, is a critical component of behavior change. And what that means is there are a lot of um, initiatives out there that are developing mobile technology that goes straight to the user. It's a service that's intended directly for the farmer. It's using SMS to send market price information directly to the farmer. While many of those can be successful, we have found that people are very reluctant to change unless there is a social engagement that they have. So in our case at Grameen, what we've done is created a program where we have built a technology platform to provide content to farmers in Uganda, relevant information for them about market information, agronomic information, advice on how to grow their crops. 
But rather than push the information to the mobile phone, we actually have identified leaders in the community. And they're equipped with a smartphone. It's actually a business for them. There are a number of ways that they generate revenue off of this. And they go out into the community and they'll speak with the farmer and, and have a dialogue about what their problems are. And they'll use this mobile phone to access information to, that the farmer might need. Now, you could push that information to the farmer. The, the rate of mobile penetration is growing so fast that soon everybody will have a mobile phone. So that's not the issue. The issue is that if the farmer receives it on the mobile phone but doesn't actually engage in a social way, the chances that he or she is actually going to change their behavior is very low. So that's one of the things that we have found. So what that also means is there's a real opportunity for maximizing opportunity for social engagement. And we can talk a little bit about some examples, but peer-to-peer -peer exchange of information, allowing farmers in Uganda to communicate with each other, to talk about their experiences, to share best practices, to share information. That can be far more compelling in terms of behavior change than having someone from the Ministry of Agriculture pushing information out to the farmer. It's a social engagement, and I think we've only cracked the surface of how to leverage those social interactions in behavior change. Okay, very quickly, um, triggers. One of the things, again, in our experience and, and that a lot of the research reveals is that information is not enough. And I laugh when I wrote this because my title is actually Vice President of Information Services. And so I'm thereby admitting that what I do is insufficient. Um, but it's true. The information is not sufficient. The how matters as much as the what. How that information is delivered matters as much as the content itself. And in my field, I think there's a lot of time spent on thinking through the content and the information that's, that we want to deliver, and not as much time on the how we're delivering it. I want to give... I want to use a quick video, if I can. Okay. Now, let me tell you. I lost, I have lost, as of this morning, as of this morning, 67 pounds since July 7th. 67 pounds and 30 inches from my bust, my uh, waist, and my hips. 7, 12, 11, I think it is. And this, let me tell you, those of you who are starting dieting or dieting a little bit, this is what 67 pounds of fat looks like. I can't, I can't lift it. Now, when you talk about, Jimmy, is this gross or what? It is amazing to me that I can't lift it, but I used to carry it around every day. And when you talk about making yourself the best you can be, do, I'm glad I did this for my heart, because my poor heart that had to send blood to all of this, all of this, it, I, it's just, it's shocking to me that it is, it is this, uh, I saw it yesterday, I said, I'm going to live on broccoli now. This show did more to contribute to women in 1988 going on a diet than just about any diet ad um, in that year. What's interesting about that um, clip is that the impact of actually seeing what she's wheeling out, right? For myself, I, that image is forever burned in my memory. Um, secondly, the fact that it's literally tangible, right? Not that you would want to touch what she's pulling out there, but it's literally tangible. It's a clear image. Um, the fact that it is both personalized and social. We didn't get a chance to see the audience, but as most of you know, Oprah's audience is primarily women, uh, and it's primarily women of a certain age, uh, and it's a lot of women who are looking for a lot of self-help. She knew exactly what her target audience was, and she is a trusted intermediary. She's probably one of the most trusted intermediaries in the United States. Um, I use that as an example because I think Oprah as a representative of the kind of change agent that we need, is a, it's a good uh, example. 
someone who's trusted, someone who has a means of communicating uh, and an ability to be able to communicate messages in a very effective way. Um, in terms of triggers, another thing that we found is attitudes often follow behavior. We think that in behavior change, we need to change people's attitudes first. That's not necessarily the case. And an example uh, from the environmental field is that um, they found that the belief, people's belief in climate change is a terrible predictor of their behavior. So if you ask someone, do you believe that climate change is real? If they say yes, that has no bearing on how they actually behave, whether they recycle, whether they drive to work or uh, take their bicycle. It's looking at their behavior and focusing on the behavior rather than the attitude is where we really need to start. Um, I'm going to go quickly over the implications for ICT. Um, I think they're somewhat implied in terms of the messaging. Um, I do want to talk about values, understanding the values of the people that we're trying to target. One of the things that I think in, in my field that we don't do well enough is I don't think we understand our clients as well as we should. We often talk about, in my field, the poor. Right? And we're going to work with the poor in the same way that we talk about Africa. Africa is a very big place, and there is more difference than there is similarity in the same way that the poor is a very large group. And being able to segment the markets that you're working in and truly understand what the different segments, what those people care about, is key to actually designing interventions that work. Okay, um, finally on ability, um, just a few comments here. My recommendations, again, from our experience at Grameen, first of all, simplify, simplify, simplify. I think there's the feeling that to do something as big as behavior change, social change, it's probably really complex, and that the messages are going to be, have to be um, probably at a higher level than what we found actually works. If we can simplify our messaging and simplify our delivery channels and our technology, that means that people have a higher ability to actually change their behavior. One example that I'll give you uh, from the Green, Green Foundation. We have a program where we have a mobile technology platform that provides information to community health workers as well as women on maternal child health. The community health workers are people that have been taken from the communities. They're, they're not health professionals. So one of the roles that we need to play is actually develop their skills. And we have developed very simple training modules that combine both integrated voice response, so you just listen to a recording on your mobile phone, as well as an interactive game that you can play on your phone. The trainings themselves are the chapters are four minutes long, and you can stop at any time if you need to, and as soon as you call back in, um, the, the training will continue. It is a deceptively simple way of delivering information and training people in the field. It's low cost. Once it's set up, it's set up. The running costs on it are very low, and it engages people because it's combined with a, a mobile game that people play where there's inherently a test that's involved. So again, a very simple approach to a really challenging problem. Secondly, I would say, think small. <laughs> the work that we do in, in social entrepreneurship is huge, and the challenges we're taking on are huge. I would encourage us all to break down the problems and think in smaller ways than the problem, the bigger problem itself might present itself. And what I mean is, when we're thinking about behavior change, don't think about getting someone to radically change their behavior from how they have always been, how they've always acted. Think about breaking down behavior change. An example would be when we think about changing health behaviors. It's very difficult in a lot of countries to get people to change sexual behavior, for example. And trying to go, it's sort of like in, in the U.S., uh, in the 80s uh, with the anti-drug campaign, it, the campaign was Just Say No. It was the biggest failure, I think, in the history of um, PSAs. Because 
it, it didn't speak to any of these factors that I'm talking about. If you can break down the problem into smaller problems and focus on more incremental behavior change, it's more effective. Secondly, I would say we often tend to think about innovation in terms of the sort of big breakthrough innovations. We think about, in technology, we think about Apple computers, right? And all of us in, in social change want to have the, our equivalent of the, the iPod right? um, in our field. Those are very rare, right? Steve Jobs became who he is because it's extremely rare for those kinds of innovations to happen. It's actually much more, I think, common but still challenging to look at innovations that are focused on processes, that are focused on delivery mechanisms and uh, changing value chains and how the value chain actually works, rather than coming up with the next big thing. And I think there is a tendency in our field to feel that we are not being successful unless we come up with the next big thing. Um, finally, I would say measure and improve continuously. Technology offers us a tremendous opportunity to constantly measure what we do and to understand far better how the impact of the work that we're doing in real time. Mobile technology in my space allows us to get real-time information flows that gives us immediate feedback about how well we're doing and whether the social change that we're trying to implement is actually working. We could be doing much more in this space, um, and I'm excited to hear about different ways that people are thinking about things. Um, I'm going to skip this slide and just give you a, a quick summary. Um, so my first point and the takeaway that I'd like to leave you with is design for individuals, not the poor in my field. Think about market segmentation. Think about breaking down the target audience that you're trying to reach into more um, rich and robust groups of people that you can really understand at a much deeper level. That will uh, dra dramatically increase your ability to be successful in reaching them. Ensure that your messaging, whatever it is, is tangible, personal, and social. Third, Ensure the technology is easy to use. I've seen a lot of mobile technology out there in which we're encouraging people to use their mobile phone to fill out a survey, and people are spending 20 minutes clicking through screen after screen after screen. If it's not easy to use, people won't use it. Find the Oprahs in your target community and use them. Find the change agents, the trusted intermediary, don't over-rely on technology to do what you're trying to do. It has to be combined. It's a tool. It's only a tool, a very powerful one, but it has to be com combined with the Oprahs. Um, I am going to skip this because it was on the last slide, but it, it really talks about leveraging mobile technology to create a lot of peer-to-peer -peer engagement, what G BJ Fogg calls massive interpersonal persuasion. Think about creating a Facebook network for the people that you are trying to serve. How can people in, that you're trying to serve engage with each other and encourage each other to affect the change that you're trying to realize? Finally, measure and improve ad infinitum. We can always be improving upon how we use technology, but we can only do it if we're measuring what it is that we do and if we understand on a very quantitative level the impact of the work that we're doing. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time.